Here we are. Here we are. <laughs> Rock and roll. I know. I know. Were you dancing too? I was. I'm always. I'm always grooving to that thing. It just. It's hard not to. Hey, Genevieve. How are you doing? I am so good. How are you? Good to see you here again. Yes. Doing well. Doing well. We were traveling this weekend. Just got back into the house thirty minutes ago. Oh, Coming geez. in hot. Yeah. I was ah. a little. It's a little out of my comfort zone to not be set up and ready to go quick, quicker than I don't I don't like that kind of a short window. That's not me. Yeah. Well, I called you. Uh, what was that? Ten minutes ago. And uh, I realized I was nervous as well because I also didn't get my call from you earlier today saying, hey, ready to do the show tonight. Making sure you're ready. I figured, you know what? She's a big girl. She, she, she'll be there. Yeah, yeah. Um, so anyone, everyone, uh, before we bring our guest on, I want to remind you to subscribe to the show if you're new here to that GD show, my Dying Out Loud channel, Dave Warnock Dying Out Loud on YouTube. Subscribe to that. Like the show because it does magic stuff somewhere, somehow. Um, we do appreciate Patreon support. I'm always bad. I'm, I'm terrible at reminding, uh, to mentioning that, but Genevieve often reminds me. <laughs> And oftentimes Bevan sticks a sign in front of me and says, remind about Patreon. But that is how we're able to do what we do. And we appreciate your support in that way. If you like what we do and you believe in it and want to support it, then Patreon is a good way to do that. Um, it's a call-in show. We've got a wonderful guest on tonight. We're going to bring him in in a minute. What what number should we call here tonight? Genevieve? You can call uh, 217-375-9933. And I will say you're going to want to call in tonight. Um, if I weren't on this show, I would already be on the phone because I would be so excited. You may slip into the other room and call incognito. <laughs> well, hopefully so, I won't have to this time. Yeah. Um, so yes, please do call in with a question for our guest or a comment or anything that's on your mind. We'd love to hear from you. And um, I don't, I don't have a trivia question prepared tonight. So let's skip it tonight. Um, we sent out a, a a mug last week to Kim Possible, one of our faithful supporters. She uh, she won half a mug once with half of the answer, but I couldn't figure out how to give her half oh. a mug. So this time she had the whole answer. Also, really quickly, Dave, I see a comment um, in the chat. Is it true? Is this our 50th episode? Oh, yes. I th uh, where'd you say? What did it? Is that uh, Alan? Yeah. Yes. Wow. The reason Alan knows that is he's a good friend. He lives here in Charlotte. He has been converting these YouTube shows to podcasts. Oh, and yes. So that's a good reminder. Thank you, Alan, to let everyone know that you can get this wonderful show via podcast now on all your favorite platforms. And soon and very soon, we're going to record a separate intro, a new intro that we can use for the YouTube show and the podcast. Because right now, if you listen to the podcast, you don't really see the intro because it's all visual. And basically, you just hear the music and then we start talking. So, But anyway, if you'd rather listen to this via podcast, it's now available. Thanks to Alan and his great work on that so yeah this is number 50 yeah. so i guess we've been doing it about a year and we've only missed a couple of weeks um yeah out of that pretty year. Good about it yeah and so it was a little daunting to take that on a year ago can we do it every week and we kind of have and i'm kind of proud of that so i'm very number proud. 50 number 50 that's a big number it that's is. that's awesome and um before I forget, next week we're going to do kind of to commemorate the the fifth the year anniversary, we're going to do a special episode behind the scenes, uh, the behind the scenes ALS episode. 
with with Bevan on as the guest, and we're gonna kind of take a peek behind the scenes of what it's like to live in our world with ALS, um, and because a lot of people just don't uh, understand, and so we're gonna kind of give people a glimpse into that world. I see Shannon Q. Thank you, Shannon Q. And she come on to see. She came to see her man on here tonight. <laughs> And might as well say I'm going to be on the Atheist Experience next Sunday with Shannon Q. So we're going to light that place up, aren't we, girl? <laughs> the world is not ready for that, I don't think. I don't think we've done a show together. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think we have. But anyway, that's enough jibber-jabber. Let's, without further ado, bring on our special guest, Paula Gia, none other than Paula Gia. There he is. There he is. I'm the very excited. You you huh? said you had a great guest on, and I'm excited to hear who it is. <laughs> it's you, dude. It's you. We see we see Shannon lurking in the chat. By the way, I don't mm. know if you've seen her there, but uh, She's the man in the house, yeah. the man behind the cartoon, none other than Paula Gia. Hello. We are we are so happy to have you on and chat with you. Um, you know, I only hope to live long enough to become a cartoon on Paula Gia's show. That's it's a low bar that I've set, but I think. All right. <laughs> well, so, yeah. I'm, so I'm not sure if that's incentive to get you on quickly or to delay so that you have to you know, keep holding. Oh, man. Whatever you think's best, Paul. All right. <laughs> <laughs> and there's Greg Markowski, our faithful first, uh, first, almost always the first super chat of the night, 1999. Great supporter. Thanks for having Paula G. He's almost as good as that really smart woman. What's her name? Shannon K, Shannon X. <laughs> Congratulations on the 50th. I think I've seen them all. Everybody loves Shannon Q. Um, it's nice to be the second smartest person in the house at any given time. Yeah. There's a lot of brain cells in that house, I must say. It's pretty intimidating. Yeah, someone says, Dave hasn't been on Paula Gia yet. See, everyone, the world is shocked, Paul. Well, that means they're not paying attention to my channel. That's what that means. Well, what, we only got to know each other. We've only known each other a short time, honestly. Um, and we yeah, got we, to we got to meet. Uh, when was that? June. Yeah, at the uh, a better the conference. Halloween. Yeah, well, I'm trying to think when that was. You and Shannon Q. I got to meet both of you there. That was a lot of fun. We had a good that time. That was awesome. It, well, yeah, and meeting you was one definitely one of the highlights for sure. Ah, uh, I could say that about you both. No, mm -hmm. I, I really was happy to be to to get to meet you guys, and you gave a great talk. Shannon gave a great talk. It was just a lot of fun, and we got it. But we yeah, we've been them. traveling around in the same circles, but we haven't. Uh, our paths haven't crossed as often. We just are sort of nodding from afar usually. Yeah, so it's exactly. exciting to to have your. Uh, quasi divided attention for a while i'll share i'll happily share it with genevieve and the, and the callers that's no problem yes exactly ella uh ella l i'm sorry congrats from australia oh and hail satan with her 666 antichrist donation i tell everyone we get several of those 666 so we're all going to hell paul you okay with that i'm well i, I yes i'm i'm more threatened by heaven than hell, frankly, at some points <laughs> in time. So, uh, yeah. it does sound a little creepy up there, doesn't it? I know, right? You're basically you've you've got your your free will stripped away because you 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 can't sin anymore. It's eternal, and you're basically just your job is to give glory every single day. I don't know. Hosanna, <laughs> Hosanna, Hosanna. Twenty four seven for gazillions of years. <laughs> yep. When we've been I there, have... ten thousand years, bright shining as the sun. <laughs> There's no less days to sing and praise than when oh. we first begun. Oh, preach it, brother. Preach it. Yep. So, so that leads us into, I want to start at the beginning with Paul. Young Paul growing up in Western Canada, right? Yes, that's correct. Western Canada, Saskatchewan, uh -huh. which is uh, difficult to spell and to say. Uh, Saskatchewan. Mm -hmm. Very good. How to, how to do. I'm not going to try to spell it. I'm not going to ask you to spell it. No, that's... No. I probably could because I'm pretty good yeah. at spelling, but Genevieve's so sort of above so bad. Mont if you picture where Montana is, it's above that. Mm. Are there any cities there? So there's two cities, uh, Saskatoon, where I, where I grew up, uh, spent a lot of my time growing up. And then there's another city called Regina, which is where okay. I went to Bible college. Oh, we're going to dig into that. Yes, we yeah. are. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to pull back all those memories. Um. So you grew up in what kind of a household? What was 
what was young Paul's early environment, your earliest memories of household earliest, or religion or whatever? So my earliest memories are actually, um, fortunately or, or unfortunately, past what I'm aware of my earliest days. My parents uh, grew up in a Mennonite community. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with Mennonites, you kind of think Amish, but 50 years ahead. So whatever the Amish are doing, the Mennonites are sort of, you know, 50 years above that. So do they have electricity I, or anything? So electricity and cars, uh, you know, and, and some of those kind of niceties. Okay. But still the same kind of pacifist, uh, fundamentalist, mod modest attire, living in community, speaking German, basically trying to stay separate from the world. Um but my parents were among the first to kind of uh, of their generation to kind of leave the community and to start to integrate themselves into secular society somewhat. Hmm. So I don't remember my earliest days as much when I would have been more part of the community. My, my memories start uh, with us already in town now still attending a Mennonite church. And so my four times a week going to church, as you all know, that's the right number. <laughs> of course it is so you got you, you got sunday morning you got sunday evening you got uh, wednesday bible study and you got youth group or whatever whatever your kids club is on you know on friday so on the friday night with pizza and the rock did you now okay so in your youth group because that's the in the evangelical charismatic world that's when you let your hair down and they, they entice the kids with pizza and the music is hopping it's christian music but it's christian rock did you guys indulge that's in that? That's a little above. So we, that was that's a little bit. I wouldn't have said we went all the way to Christian rock. That was for at home. If you wanted to listen to, <laughs> so I'm going to date myself here. So if you wanted to listen to like Petra and Amy Grant and uh, Evie and whatever else, you know that kind of stuff. You that would that would be at home. But wait, you couldn't listen to Amy fucking Grant at church. I mean, that's no, weird. no, 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 no. Because I mean, at my church, oh we were my singing, god. My earliest memories, we were still singing in German, right? Not even in English. So, oh wow, um, yeah, no. So, so shortly after I went off to Bible college and then came back from Bible college, then I became a worship leader at my church. Okay, and we started introducing things like um, acoustic guitars and and like many years later, like drums. So when I left, it was still. Like the organ was when it was getting crazy because normally you'd want to do it a cappella. A cappella is the best God's way. That's kind of worth the, the that's the purest way for them, right? Yeah. So, um, okay. So these are all just, you know, anachronistic things. But no, I mean, eventually my Christian life. So I ended up going to a, what was called the Christian Missionary Alliance Bible College, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which was basically formed out of renegade mennonites is what we always called it it was like the the worldly mennonites who were willing to you know listen listen to dc talk came to my bible college while i was there and oh that was, wow that's off that the was, chart yeah that was a little bit uh, for me that was a little bit over over the top but yeah. even for you so you you even looked at that going okay i'm not sure about this oh for sure for sure because my wow my, my upbringing was very fundamental very you know obviously the a lot of that old school type stuff. And so, I mean, honestly, the hymn, I still miss the hymns. Like when I find myself singing or humming something Christian, it's mm -hmm. usually the hymns or the Hallelujah Chorus or something along those lines, right? Where where um, it's God's music. <laughs> it's funny how God's music is always whatever your generation was, right? Yeah. Yeah, we, we kind of in three different zones here. Uh, you grew up from birth as a, yeah. in a Christian household. I, I didn't, mine was non-religious. I found Jesus in the Jesus movement of the seventies as a teenager, um, 18, almost, almost a an, out of my teens, but, and then Genevieve was a cradle atheist. So mm -hmm. we, we kind of come at this from all the different, the, the three different ways one can, I, I guess. guess. So, yeah. 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 We do really cover the gamut. I, I, so I'm curious, Paul, you know, you, you go to Bible college. Was it something that was sort of an expectation in your house that, you know, that you would specifically go and become a like a leader in the church and go to the Bible college? Or was that just like your 
of your own volition, you were like, this is what I want to do. I have a hard time answering that question. I've asked myself that very thing. I put a lot of pressure on myself at being a competitive Christian. Mm. Like I, so not everyone who is like, not everyone who's raised with me became the kind of Christian that I was, but I became a Bible quizzer. For example, I won scholarships to go to Bible college by competing in Bible memory. And I was all in on all the things. And I spent, you know, my summers as a, as a Bible camp counselor. So I don't know how much of it was my personality mm -hmm. that like really latched on and whatever I do, I do competitively. If you, anyone's ever watched my channel, I'm, you can tell that I'm a little bit obsessive about things that needn't be obsessed over, but yet I, I do. Um, <laughs> I, I sort of, so part of it's my, I, I don't, I wish I knew the answer to that question. I certainly, I felt like I was, the golden child in my church like that i was there was certainly i felt there was an expectation for me to go to bible college and to be on stage worship leading and to be a youth leader like i felt like there was that pressure but i couldn't honestly look anyone in the eye and say that you know you forced me to do this i i was convinced that you know god's will for my life was what i was seeking yeah. And I didn't I didn't want to go to Bible college. I wanted to go off and become a computer programmer. Um, hmm. Computers, you know, I was the people in my community didn't even own computers or have computers. That wasn't even a thing. But I was so obsessed that that seemed like a really cool thing. Um, so but I went to Bible college and I basically did, did what I thought I was supposed to do. Right. I'm supposed to. OK, well, I came and I, I put myself in this position. Now, can you give me the career I wanted. And I did end up in the career I wanted. I, I became a computer programmer while I was at Bible college. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I don't, I, I thought it was God doing that, but you know, look in hindsight, it's all those weird things we attribute to God. Yeah. It was really like, no, it's what I wanted. And I found a way to make it be God's will. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot oh, yeah. of people do. That. Oh, we do it all the time. I think uh, as Christians, you, you hear God speaking and it, Conveniently, right. he's he's saying the thing yeah. you wanted wanted him to wanted him to say. Actually, the big thing was, did God want to send me overseas? It wasn't just graduate from Bible college because that was fine. Graduating from Bible college is fine, but did I need to go overseas? Which was what most of my friends were doing, mm -hmm. and uh, and that was me. It's like, oh, I'll, I'll in my head, I was like, okay, if you if you really call me, I will go. But I never felt <laughs> it. Right? Mm -hmm. So. Well, as an aside, right as an uh, on a side trail that we won't go down, I just laughed to myself when you said you're you're super competitive because I happen to know that Shannon Q is too, so I can only mm. imagine what that household is like. <laughs> we uh, oh we don't God. do we don't do games night as often as we. No, would. I wouldn't <laughs> think you uh, would. It ends with one of us unhappy. Unhappy <laughs> is a mild word. Kim Possible, mm. thank you for your. Antichrist super chat and your support faithfully every week. We appreciate you. So it sounds to me like what you're saying, and it, it correct me if I'm wrong. You kind of outran your parents spiritually. You were more zealous for the Lord than they were. Would that be accurate? I don't know how to quantify more. Like they are still Christians and they still are incredible people that I would model my life after whether I was a Christian or not. Um, and they are incredibly faithful and their service to like, so I lost a lot of my community, virtually all my community. Right. Um, but my parents never wavered, right. They, they continued to love me unconditionally every minute of it, even when I was doing things that I knew grieved their hearts greatly. Mm -hmm. um, and so like in that way, who's to say who's more faithful? I, <laughs> not so much I, faithful just that you were pursuing god with a, a, competi I was, a pe competitive zeal and when I you was, say and they kind of yeah. came out of that fundamentalism and started moving into a more progressive version of that so i'm not well progressive not, progressive for them i mean they they were, they were still young earth creationists right and they were, you know right right uh, and all the things that go along with that it's just that they were um, willing to wear mixed fabrics, as it were, right? <laughs> and have have more oh, than the three shame. buttons on your so shirt, scandalous. right? The yeah. shame, the shame. There's a super so, chat from Anton with a question. Let me throw that out to you, Anton. 
Thank you for your support. Paula, you're familiar with the second Vatican Council that aimed to bring back the youth to church by making spiritual retreats? That it- so I, I think this is slightly facetious, but uh, as a youth leader myself, and just like for both, uh, for quite a while as a camp counselor and a camp director, and then later on as, as a youth leader of you know, programs of hundreds of teens, I look back and how much of it like was us deliberately setting these kids up to be manipulated. You're keeping, you, you take them away from their parents. You have overnight oh, things that they're not with their parents. You give them a uh, unhealthy diet that they aren't necessarily used to having. You give them sugar, you keep them up late at, later than they would normally would be. You have them with affirming just they've in the most affirming place that these kids have. some of the kids have ever been. Yeah. You, um, you are singing them, you're doing work, you're doing songs and activities of these, this affirmation. And then, you know, at the peak of it's 1 a.m. and you got them wound up with all the music and they're overtired, that's when you hit them with an altar call, right? That's right. And they come to and... the Lord or they rededicate their Lord or they commit their life to ministry or, oh right. my and God, you... You, t- you talk about a manipulative tool, 100%. Like, I feel terrible about, and, I feel like my whole channel and everything I do in a way is partly as a penance for the, the harm that I feel like I did mm. all those years to mm. those kids. And I've fortunately, I've had some of them come back to me, both Christian Christians, then people who have left who have um, come back and forgiven me and given me, you know, some kind of closure on for for some of them uh, that that i didn't need that i don't need to be so hard on myself as i was but the youth youth ministry is in my view manipulation top to bottom oh 100 percent, yeah and you were a youth minister then so you went to bible school and and then you came out of bible school and took a job at a church is that right so i as i mentioned i had this weird relationship with god here where god was letting me pursue my secular per interests as long as I also served in the church. So I, I did those things as lay ministers without getting paid. Gotcha. Uh, which is common in churches, right? Or at least in, in my day, it was where there'd be, uh, they love it when you go and you earn your money during the day, but still give them 40 hours a week. Right. Yeah. The, uh, what's the, that's the best of all worlds. Now were these so, churches large or small what was the typical size church you were in? Uh, so I worked with the typical church that I would be involved with would be somewhere between 5,000, 500 to a thousand people normally, including when I moved to California. Oh, I that's pretty good size. Settled into that church. Um, but I was involved with youth programs, so I was in, involved with like provincial and statewide programs often. So I would be dealing with five to 600 kids at youth events typically. So, whoa. Yeah, yeah. You had, you had a lot of influence there. As I said, I was competitive about it, <laughs> but <laughs> weirdly, like I was competitive about it, but I didn't look into it. Like I, I was trained in my denomination. Well, when you say you didn't look into it, like you didn't investigate the faith. And... Like I went to, Bible college, but I didn't like I, when they would just say things like Mark wrote Mark. Okay. I'm or, saying I'm the same man. Didn't challenge or it. that. Right. Or, the, you know, we've looked into this and evolution is dumb. All right. You've looked into it. <laughs> evolution is dumb. You. I'll just, no, there's no, no point in me spending my time. I have youth. I, I have to get pizza for the next youth night. Right. <laughs> so I'm not going to spend any of my time looking into what my authorities have told me is settled. Doesn't that, that was, blow your mind now looking back? Just like, yeah. what what the fuck? How could I? Are you, I'm not that stupid. But I was. Right. Uh, and it was, in a way, it's a, it's a shortcut that re- some sections of religion offers you is that you don't have to think all this stuff for yourself because yeah, yeah. we, we, we've got to figure it out. We've done so all I, the work, I, right. I don't know to what, again, I feel like I was complicit in my own indoctrination in those ways right i didn't i didn't take it upon myself to ask the deeper questions you do you you say you i mean do you still feel bad about it even now oh yeah really very much yeah yeah um i feel like i stole from myself decades of my own life yeah and you only have yourself to blame 
Right. I don't. Yes. I, I'm. I'm angry at no human other than myself. Mm -hmm. Wow. I. I totally understand that. I mean, I've felt a lot of that in my life as well. I gave three and a half decades to this thing. Right. That I will. I won't get back. And the best years of my life. Um, but I don't. I. I don't think I still feel bad about it. I've really been able to let go and realize that was me doing the best I could do. That was me doing doing my best i figured out you know like the quote i've used a lot do the best you can do until you know better then when you know better do better and i really thought i was doing the right thing for the right reasons there was no bad motive in what i was doing i really thought i was helping people get closer to god because that was going to be what was best for their lives um and so looking at it from that viewpoint although there's no excuse for my ignorance it's still the best I knew to do at the time. Mm -hmm. But I see what you're saying. I mean, we so never investigated me that, it. I didn't you know go, go, easy, I, go easy on yourself is what I'm saying. Okay. Well, I didn't mm -hmm. know there was a non-angry atheist phase. So if you're telling me there is, then I'll look ahead for it. Look ahead. I, I, I found one, honestly. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Maybe I'm just that ignorant. What are you thinking, yeah. G Genevieve? I mean... My thinking altogether is that the, the angry atheist phase is one that is so valid, but I would not, under any circumstance, really turn that anger on yourself. I mean, you know, I know that your parents sort of left the the more insular Mennonite community, but it still sounds pretty, pretty insulated, um, is yeah. as a Mennonite in Saskatchewan. Um, so my, you know, my thinking is why would you even think that you would have to ask those deeper questions that why that one why would that ever be something that would occur to you um knowing everything that you knew and and coming from an environment where you know your parents who when you're a small child at least for me you know those are your superheroes you know they tell you to right. walk you walk you run you run um i just i would i would never um hold that against you Especially well, am, since when it comes to this this uh, repentance uh, train that you've been on with all the work that you're doing with your channel, I mean, I think you've more than made up for for any of the of the youth you um, benevolently manipulated. <laughs> you've done your penance. Come on out. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. So now I'm on the second half. I'm now on. I'm like Dave. I'm on the uh, I'm on the cautionary tale train part of my life now, where it's like, man, if I can. Uh, help save a few others a little earlier than I was. That's my, now, that's my new goal. Yeah. And I think you're doing that. I mean, your channel has blown up. You, you've got all these people that are watching it and you're giving, you're doing, you have great, uh, great content. I mean, your research and your, the quality is incredible and it's helping people look at things in a way that you never did. For one thing, Paul, remember, we did not have the tools that are available now. This is true. To look into what the the preacher said it, and where am I going to go to to check out to fact check what he said? I, I I don't have the time to go down to the library and pull up, you know, some kind of a whatever they used at the library. They're, they're, we couldn't pull our phone out of our pocket and fact check him. Well, no, and in fact, the only you know the kind of libraries I would have gone to, you know, in in Christian communities, I I don't think that. Uh... I don't think there were many copies of Richard Dawkins or Christ Christopher Hitchens books for me to check out of my library. Exactly. So uh, as I look back, I'm, I'm, you were probably doing this. You you were working in the 80s along this time in the 90s, 80s and 90s. I was a decade or so ahead of you, probably. Yep. Um, but no, there was no way to. And then why would I question what this authority figure who right. I trusted? Why would I, I? What's wrong with me? I would think. If I had these doubts pop in my head and my pastor or spiritual leader was telling me and I was going, wait a minute, I would feel like that skepticism and that doubt would be uh, something coming from the devil. And I, I would. Oh, I would, yeah. You're not. I'd rebuke the that, shit out of that. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> so Absolutely. there was nothing in us to make us want to to fact check or to question what they were saying it, it but because also it lined up with everything that our whole world was telling us you live in such an insular bubble that there are right. no outside voices casting doubt on anything you're hearing which always makes me surprised when i hear that someone became a christian later on i was like really yeah 
why what you and, talk about an idiot i mean you were born into it i came into it willingly as an 18 year old i mean i could i could beat myself up a lot worse mm. <laughs> come on dave you should know better than that i assume I, that was was it from a rally like i was describing no well yes it was a um it, it was a um a scene it was a, a youth group uh seen in a house in west texas that my brother okay. took me to where there were like 50 kids packed into this room all enthusiastically worshiping god and speaking in tongues and the energy in the room was palpable right. and it to walk out of that and not partake of it is kind of like thinking okay i'm missing out on something here because there was nothing in my life that that paralleled or competed with that kind of energy you know, I'm living this boring life, contemplating college, but not really sure how to navigate that. And I'm thinking there's a lot more going on in that room than what I got going on. So that's what happens in the minds of these youth, you know, right. uh, at these rallies and these summer camps and stuff. Sounds a little like Bart Campolo's story. Yeah. In fact, Bart um, is coming on the show in two weeks. Oh, yes. Yeah. And I'm, I just did his his podcast, uh, which just came out about a, sometime last week. So if you listen to Excellent. Mark Campolo's Humanize Me, he is yeah. a wonderful, wonderful man. I love Bart. Yeah. We have similar stories. Yeah. So I'm, I'm anxious to have him on the show and unpack that with him. Cool, cool. But, but we've got calls blowing the screen up. So uh -oh. let's, yeah, here we go. Um, <laughs> let's pause the, the conversation about your journey because I want to get back to that. But let's take a call from Mark. He, him in Indiana, and he's got a question for you about messianic prophecies. Mark, me, are you with okay. us? I'm right here. How you hey, doing tonight, Dave? Hey, Mark. Thanks for calling in. You're on with Genevieve and Dave and the one and only Apologia. And you wanted to ask yes, him about Paul, yeah. ask him hey. about messianic prophecies. What what kind of question you got for Paul? I was wondering what his take was on the fact that uh, Jesus did not fulfill them. Oh, interesting. So do you have any particularly particular in mind that you think were unfulfilled? All of them. Okay. <laughs> so uh, I think you and I are just going to have a whole lot of agreement on this front. So in order to make this call interesting, I guess, uh, what's your take on it before uh because i i don't need to retread necessarily what what everyone else is going to say okay um i got kind of curious about it some time back and it's been banging around in my head recently over the last couple of weeks um i checked into the what the jews say the messianic prophecies are and he didn't even come close i mean there's a character in the new testament that comes a lot closer but Christian writers have demonized him. Basically, okay. it's the Antichrist and Revelation comes a lot closer. Right. Okay, so that tells me a little bit about where you're, what angle you're coming from. So you actually think that um, there were messianic prophecies, me messianic ones, and that um, and that Jesus failed to fulfill them, which is great. Um, I I would also agree. I'm not Jewish myself, but you can look up any number of rabbi who will tell you at great length, why Jesus fails as a Messianic Jew. Um, messianic, you know, uh, the Messiah for of, yeah. of the Jewish people. Right. What, Of course, what an, an evangelist like me would say is that the Jews are completely wrong in how they interpret their own book. Uh, they, they don't, they, they get upset. I'll go with Mormons, that too, they think it's true. Yeah, well, they, get, <laughs> they get upset when the Mormons take their book and try and make a sequel, but the Christians are allowed to make their own sequel to uh, to the Old Testament for some for some reason. For me, these prophecies, a lot of the, I have criteria that I think for me are reasonable to expect out of a prophecy. The first is that it's you know clear, and, and right. The second is and and fulfilled by you know a single, relate definable, definite, fulfilled thing. The three that the prophecy was actually written before the event that supposedly fulfills it. Uh, and four, that would be, the, you know, that we actually can confirm that the thing was fulfilled. And so, unfortunately, exactly. a lot of things, Christians pull out something like 300 different 
items, you know, from the Old Testament and even from within the New Testament, which is even more ridiculous, that they would say that Jesus fulfills. And then they like to give some kind of stats about how unlikely or likely it is that a certain might, you know, fulfill some of these. Well, some of these prophecies are just like, for example, that he will be hated. And it's like, well, which human exactly <laughs> on the earth, you know, isn't hated by someone? Uh, or that he will be, you know, born of a woman is one of the prophecies. I'm like, well, okay, that, that, how does that count? Checkmate, um, atheist. <laughs> right. So that narrows it down from seven and a half billion to seven point four nine billion. You know. Exactly. Um, <laughs> and then you know you look at well, Jesus per, Jesus predicted his own death. Well, did he, or was it foreshadowing? So you know, for example, when there's a Harry Potter book. And they prophesy something in chapter one, and in chapter thirteen it happens. Well, that's the same book, man. Like we, it's mm -hmm. you can't show me that that was a prophecy. That's literary device. So, I mean, those are some of my thoughts about mm -hmm. just the nature of prophecy in general. I don't know if that aligns with what you were hoping to hear, and maybe Genevieve and Dave have their own thoughts as well. But does that help in any way? What you were what you were thinking about? Oh yeah, we're. We're we're very close to on the same exact page. I'd say we're, uh, you know, within a paragraph or two of each other. Okay, sounds good. I mean, the other thing to watch out for is in the Old Testament when they talk about things that were prophesied in the Old Testament and then later allegedly fulfilled, either by Israel becoming a nation or other things that happened in the Old Testament. I mean, keep in mind that a lot of these books, like the portions of Isaiah, which are really three different books stitched together, you know, were written after the events that they're prophesying about. So those are, that's another gotcha when it comes to non messianic prophecies. So anyway, I will hand over. I, will, I didn't I know about, thank you. What would you say? Um, I, I know one of the main uh, prophecies that I recall as a Christian being um, slam dunk about Jesus was Isaiah. Was it 53 Paul? Mm -hmm. Suffering servant. Suffering servant. I um I didn't I didn't win Bible classes memorizing <laughs> scripture like you did because I wasn't nearly as competitive. But can you recall some of the key points, the bullet points of that prophecy? Um, well, so, so, I mean, just a lot of the key points are um, boy, um, I, I I'm blanking now. Now you put me on the spot here. But I'm the, sorry. The one thing I mean, I'm trying one to remember things, it. Uh, uh, it, it's 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 vaguely that you know that that they'll be wounded. Uh, wounded are for our transgressions yeah. right, for our by transgressions. his stripes we are healed right so those are that all was, in there yeah that was a big part of okay jesus just slam dunk that one i mean uh but of course the context of that is you know if you look at isaiah 52 and 51 the context is israel as the person that as as not the person they're talking about as but as the entity they're talking about so you the jewish rabbi i was speaking of earlier will take great exception that in Isaiah 53, you are switching that subject <laughs> that they're talking about as stripping away the importance of Israel suffering for people's right. sins. Right. As opposed, and then putting that onto a man, Jesus, when their idea of a Messiah is of a triumphant king, right? So the Christians will say, well, look how unexpected it was. And the, <laughs> the Jews will say, it's unexpected because you're interpreting it wrong. So, mm -hmm. um, of course, the another one is you know in where they say that the the virgin will give birth to a child is is in close to that area, and of yeah. course that the you look at the Hebrew word Alma and Alma is not normally it's virgin it just means young girl in general in the Pentateuch they translated it to a specific word that more closely meant virgin and then the author of Matthew decided well he only had the Greek version so you know created the story of the virgin and that's where sometimes you can kind of see where some of these literary devices happen where oh if he'd have known hebrew he'd have known that's a bad translation but right. he didn't he knew right he knew only the greek so i, I don't remember mistranslation no that was a, that that's another one that that we you know that was born of a virgin that's that's supposed to be another slam dunk for jesus because right of course, and of course three verses later and if you look up that passage you know then the the, the person is born who they're referring to right so right right well, then the Christians will say, well, no, it's a double prophecy. It was a prophecy for the time, but also for all time. And it's like, well, then, so just everything's prophetical. So um, they, you know, yeah. they will divide as, they will divide his clothes. Well, that's in a section 
that's just talking. It's just in Psalms, I think, where they're talking about dividing clothes. But, you know, the author of Matthew, again, pulled that little proof texted, uh, grabbed a thing and, and applied it to what Jesus' life was supposed to be. So Yeah, and I think that's the basic problem that I've seen for all of that. When you've got a prophecy, when, you, when you're writing, let's, let's assume the writers of the Gospels, for argument's sake, or who they say they are, uh, or who it's attributed to, Matthew, like you just said, if, mm -hmm. if you're trying to, if, the, if I'm writing this book for the purpose of convincing some people of something, and I can make some prophecy that I read fit this argument that I'm trying to make, well, I'm going to squeeze it in. I'm going to make right. it fit. And it, to me, that's what looks like happens more often than not. Yeah, it's very easy to uh, to tie stories together and make them mirror each other when you're, you're working off the source material. That's an argument that I hear all the yeah. time that, <laughs> oh, it's not that it's just one book. It's that it's a collection of books with thousands of years span between them. And they all will come together to to make this perfect, beautiful story. It's like, yeah. When I watch a, a stand-up comedian, when the last line of the show is a callback to what they first said, I'm not blown away because it's this like holy prophecy that came true. And and the other thing as well um, with with smaller stories is I, I also wonder how much um, how much is it a creative liberty and how much of it is just manifesting your own destiny it's like did you have a prophecy paul that one day uh you would become a computer programmer right um, or is that a goal and then you set things in motion and made that happen well that's largely when you look at the everyone says well it said that the nation of israel would be restored again well for hundreds of years christians were actively working to restore israel to a nation status yeah. specifically because they knew there was a prophecy that said that needed to happen. So if millions of people are working towards a goal, you know, yeah. that, again, is that real? Exactly. I, it's, gonna, what you, it's what you said. I'm going to force fit this square peg into this round hole. I don't got, right. you know, whatever it takes. <laughs> and then, yeah. you know, mission accomplished when it finally worked. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's a good call, Mark. Thank you for calling in. We're going to take another call here real quick, but thanks for calling the show and chatting with us. Appreciate it. All right, you guys take care. All right. Bye, Mark. I thought he was going to challenge us on uh, some prophecies. I thought he had a gotcha question for you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this guy might. So let's take, or uh, not this person. I don't know. I don't know who it is. Oh, he, him. Um, location from God, I think. I guess so. Mm -hmm. um, let's just see what we got here. Hello, Ultimated Christian, YouTuber. What, what you got for us tonight? Yes, I can prove to you that our Christian God exists in words, as we all know that he exists within our souls. So that's what I would like to talk about. Do you have any questions? Well, I, I want to uh, not concede that second point, but I'm willing to put a pin in it for now. Mm -hmm. Like one at a time, right, Paul? Yep. Okay, I, I ahead. don't know. I don't know that God exists, but carry on. Yeah, go ahead and make your uh, make your claim or, or your statement that you want to prove, if you will. Well, firstly, everybody knows God exists because no. God is love. No, Therefore, no, He would no. reveal Himself to no. everybody. No, got to stop you. you. You don't get to just say something, make an assertion, and then run on past it as though we all agree with you because we don't. I don't. When you say everyone knows God exists, I'm going to have to stop you because I disagree with that very first statement. Paul, Genevieve, you, your well, thoughts on that? I've okay, already, go ahead. I've already objected, so go, go ahead. Okay, objected, noted. Um, go ahead. Finish your statement. Yeah, firstly, yeah, this is Ultimate Christian YouTuber. Um, I do have a YouTube channel, Ultimated Christian. We're not plugging so channels. No, we're not. We're not. Christian. You're not here to plug. We're not here to plug your channel. But go ahead and make your statement. Yeah. So God is ultimate truth biblically. Therefore, we reference him for facts, as he is the precondition for creaturely intelligibility. So, an example of a fact is for us to identify ourselves to be creaturely slash limited in size, we have to reference that to God as he is ultimate perfection. 
and okay furthermore... we need to pause we need to pause you're throwing out a lot of words there's a salad. lot to unpack here yeah um, let's pause and take one of your many assertions and deal with that how's that can, can you start with her definition of truth, please? sorry i'm referencing ultimate truth can you define truth for us please? you made an assertion can you define truth God for us please truth. define so, truth for us paul says absolute eternal and revelatory wait can, can, can you hear me god define truth can you hear the for words us? i'm yes, saying I can hear you. okay can you define yes. truth for us please Truth is God, as they are. Okay, so if you say eternal. if you say truth is God, if you say truth is God, then you can come to no conclusion other than God exists. So this is a very use thing. You've that's called begging the question. You've put the conclusion in the premises. It's not. It's it's not how. So it is. You can't just say that's not. <laughs> here's the thing you can't take this thing god and then just define it by things that we know exist things like things like love and things like truth if you are defining something like truth or love as god and saying that that's why it exists then you can't it, it's just I, I i i feel like you are worshiping your thesaurus more than you are your Bible or your logic or reasoning skills? Yeah, please refrain from any slanderous comments. Focus on the arguments, not slanderous comments. Personal. We're trying to yeah, focus so on the arguments, all... but you're using such word sound, Can... we really can't even pick apart what you're saying. So you didn't I give mean... me a name to go by, and I'm sorry about sorry about that. But can you? So I'm going to give you my definition of truth, and you can tell me where we differ. How about that? Okay. So truth is that which conforms to reality as adjudicated by predictive power. And what's your definition of reality? Reality is that which exists. Yes, but you have to... What are the adjectives to the noun reality from your perspective? I, I don't need adjectives to that which exists. Yes, reality is a noun, so you have to list the adjectives. So an adjective is a descriptive word. So how do you describe reality as we are in God's reality? But well, no, but no, because you just you just okay. So you just that. added the word you just added the word God to it for no good reason. That doesn't Let's, make like, it if, more real. If, if God is real, God exists. God, if God is real, then my definition of truth includes God, and if God is not real. My definition is also still correct, right? That's how we that's how we don't smuggle in our assumption at the start. My my definition allows for either conclusion. Would you agree? Uh, can you repeat that last bit? Sure. My definition question, of truth. Your last question. Yeah, my definition of truth is that which conforms to reality as adjudicated by predictive power. And that definition allows for there to be a God or for there not to be a God. And when we use that definition, we can have an honest, we can have an honest quest to see whether God exists or not. If, if you use your definition, then we can't come to either conclusion. We can only come to the God conclusion. And that's a problem with your definition. Your response to me presuppose our Christological God as God is ultimate truth because he is absolute, eternal, and revelatory. So to put this into perspective, for a particular to be eternal has to be all-powerful to sustain their own existence. To be no. all-powerful, you have <laughs> you're, to be all-knowing. You can, can you demonstrate you're, you're, this you with keep, examples in nature? You keep making assertions as though we have to agree because, you know, I could just as easily say... I like I like uh, butter pecan ice cream, so therefore that butter pecan ice cream is God, and it's creamy and delicious and sweet. And I'm starting to use all these words that you use in a different framework. And how do you you can't just assert something like that and make it true because it's something you want to be true. 
you're not giving us any there's evidence nothing, that what, what you're asserting is true. There's nothing wrong with what I said, as God is a brute fact. So you actually making an assertion that you no, can't but, back no, up. So you're, actually, you're, you're not, your statement that God is a brute fact is an assertion. Do you not see that? No, it's a brute fact. There's <laughs> no, a difference I, so, between an assertion and a brute fact. Uh, a, a brute fact but my, I, I, I will equally say energy is eternal. That is a brute fact in my worldview. That's impossible. What? No, it's a brute fact. Well, I can explain why. Only God can be a brute fact as his irreducible attributes are fundamental to his existence. So if energy is, slash matter is dimensional with height, depth, and width. No, no it's not. It is no, parts. no, it is not. <laughs> energy it scientists is. do not accept in any way that, that, that energy need be temporal or occupy space. That is not something that is generally settled. I said that it's three dimensional. No, th that's that's what I mean by that's what I meant by spatial, three dimensional. We're using the same words. Yes, and because we occupy space, our physical vessels are three dimensional. We, we so do it's irreducibly but... complex. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So you're trying to define I'll... you're trying to define God's existence. You are trying. You are. You're not understanding that declaring a brute fact doesn't make a brute fact correct. Uh, I, I don't know where to go from here if you're I, just going to try and define it. I think it. we need a lot of dressing for this word salad, and it's not, it's not tasting very good to me because of that. It's a little bland, and it's not going down well. I think you just want to hear yourself talk, and you don't seem to want to engage. No. In it. Yeah, yeah, I think so. No, yeah, I think so. No, I think just because you say something doesn't make it true. So we're going to need to let you I'm go because this is going nowhere. Dodging. And you're not. Are you no, oh, are yeah, you I'm dodging. Yeah, I'm running from you because you've got ultimate truth and you've got God. So I'm going to run because I'm scared. Okay, bye. So begging that the was question a waste policy. of time. Yeah, he was. He's basically just every state. Every statement was begging the question. Yeah. Yeah. So there's no. Yeah, I, 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 I saw in the chat he's been banned from most channels. I thought we would entertain oh, him for a while. He's called him before. I recognize the voice. And it's just, it's impossible to communicate with people like that. They don't really want to have a conversation. Yeah. It reminds hey, me well. of Michael, Michael Scott declaring bankruptcy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I declare my bankruptcy. He, he doesn't understand that's not, that's how, not it how it works. <laughs> or, or Trump declaring bankruptcy. Declassified. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, oh. Same thing. Same Thank thing. You. So we left mm -hmm. off. You were in Bible school. You came back. You got. Uh, we got a couple yeah. of calls, but I want to chat a little bit more about about your story and how you got from uh, competitive, faithful, <laughs> Bible believing, exuberant Christian giving your to spare time. Atheist. Yeah, giving your spare time to the <laughs> church. Um, what began to unravel for you, Paul? I know you've told this a thousand times, but let's hear it again. So one of my one of my jobs, many jobs that I did in between was that I owned a comic book company and we were selling material, despite the fact that we were always trying to make sure that our material was, you know, godly type material. We were selling it to a secular audience and I was writing a comic that involved dinosaurs and I felt like I needed to throw a few bones for the fools in the audience who thought that evolution was true. Mm -hmm. Just throw them some bones where I could without, you know, without being blasphemous. So I started looking up just some on the internet, some details about dinosaurs. And I'd always been told how stupid all this was, but man, some of those details actually seemed like they maybe made sense. <laughs> yeah. And so, I mean, all that did was it created a bit of, it put a pebble in my shoe, right? There was a bit of niggling in my brain, some cognitive dissonance. And I got to a, point specific point in my career where I was actually had a couple of months between big projects that I was working on and I'm like you know what I'm going to go find out all the reasons why evolution is dumb and I so I ordered the Ken Ham books because I knew that would tell me right well I got all the Ken Ham books and I read those oh and boy. I got I got partway through them 
And I literally, at one point, it just dropped to the floor. And I'm like, these answers are terrible. I still believe everything that Ken Ham believes, but these are bad answers. And so part of me was like, you know what? Let's go read what the nasty evolution people say. And it didn't take me long to plow through that and to realize that they, you know, they had their stuff was correct. Like they mm. or it made a lot of sense. Now that doesn't destroy your faith. Of course, there's lots of people who harmonize Christianity and, and evolution. But then I started thinking, well, I was just assuming that young earth creation was right. What if I looked at the Bible, but didn't assume that it was correct while I was doing this mm, dangerous game you're playing there. Paul. And that was, and that was it. So then I started seeing things like, well, Jesus thinks the earth is young and Jesus thinks Adam and Eve are mm -hmm. real. And Oh my goodness. My Bible school professors didn't tell me that, um, that all be all about all these literary devices. And sure. I, I, I vaguely knew that there were portions of the new Testament that were inserted later, but who cares? It's all inerrant anyway. You know, when you, when you start to look and, the signs of this book are that it's a human book. Yeah. But it's not like if you just look at the signs, it's it, it, there's nothing divine about it. And, 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 and eventually it just got to the point where I couldn't hold on to the, to my faith any longer. So then I slipped into a mode of, well, the Holy spirit can still save this. Right. So for me, the Bible as in air, was gone. And I was the kind of person that if the Bible was only 99% correct, it might as well be garbage. Cause we were told that it's a hundred percent. Um, and that's the kind of black and white thinker I was, I, I admit. Um, so I went on this journey of just like crying out to the Holy Spirit over and over, like just s reveal to me something and like give me these emotional reasons to believe. And none of that was coming back to me either. And then I, I prayed my last uh, earnest prayer on a treadmill at one point and, and, and figured, I figured out that I, I no longer believed. And then through through the thinking atheist, I discovered the word atheist, that it wasn't terrible and what that meant. And, wow. and, uh, my, and my journey here began. I shared that with um, a couple of people that I probably weren't safe to share with. And, and they kind of blew up my world. Mm. And this was in 2015. Um, and I wasn't in control of my own narrative as a as I was exited, I lost a lot of community. I lost a lot of friends and family and a lot of people never spoke to me. And very shortly after that, I was diagnosed with a very serious cancer. And so I had almost no period of being able to figure this out. I went from being kind of cast out to fighting for my life, uh, for my health. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, way more people than is, than, than should have, you know, that was that, well, this is God, you know, this is God giving you this cancer, right? To yeah, show, yeah. To to either to strike me down or to bring me back or however. Bring you back to him, right? Uh -huh. Supposed to go, right? Um, but it didn't have that effect. Um, for those of you who, brought, I I have hair now. I you know I'm back. I'm I'm, I'm a couple years uh, free of my cancer, but it was quite serious at the time. And so, and then, you know, shortly after that, because it was so serious, and with all my children being still theists they were unwilling to have conversations with me about mm. heaven and hell. And that, and that's fair. You know, these are children I raised and their dad's baggage and their dad's journey is not their journey. Right. They were still faithful. And so it was an, un, it was unfair of me to maybe expect that they might. So, but I wasn't sure I was going to be around. And so I needed a way to time capsule some of my thoughts. And I, because I had been involved in animation and video production, I thought, you know what, if I put my thoughts up on YouTube, Mm -hmm. that will outlast me and so but i looked sick at the time and didn't want to you know i yeah. I, I understand that on the on the internet the way it's not fair but there is some judgment about how you present yourself and mm -hmm. and how that message is perceived and weirdly enough like especially in the christian evangelical community right right like you have to look a certain way to be on stage not just anyone oh, yeah. can be on stage yeah um anyway so i wasn't feeling the way i needed to so i'm like well i'm gonna draw a cartoon i'm gonna animate this and i'm gonna get this message you know onto the internet to be this life raft of of thoughts that hopefully one day uh, my children will find a bit of a that's, time capsule. I, I did not know that part of your story i, th I think that's fantastic yeah uh, so i was trying to do told... the speedrunner version but yeah no you were told at one at that point that you might be terminal we shared that when Correct. we met yeah that yeah that you had oh, a terminal I, disease and you were going to, you had limited time is what you thought. 
Yeah, absolutely. And, and so at one point I, I, I was living with, you know, four weeks to live was, was their estimate until they could get me in. So until they got me in and they got me to uh, another set of high res scans that they decided, okay, I wasn't necessarily going to die. I, I spent about a week, you know, in that limbo where it might be the last four. So, mm -hmm. um, and so when I, now I have Christians, you know, telling me, well, you've, you only think this way because you've, you know, never experienced death and no atheists in foxholes. Right. And it's like, no, no, it survived my, uh, it survived my diagnosis, my, my atheism and all this kind of thing. So, um, anyway, that's, so that's, that, that got you to doing your, your YouTube channel and you wanted to start your, your YouTube channel is very, um, thorough and, and I, I want to say cerebral in a way you're really <laughs> break, breaking apart the Christian arguments very carefully with it. And, and, so that was your was that your way of were you thinking I want to communicate this to my kids or yeah so my audience is very specifically to my children and that's gotcha. why I think one difference that people have over the years of people have noticed in my content versus some other atheist content out there is for example I never curse on my own channel yeah I um, I present things in a way that I would have I, I was fresh enough out I was only months yeah. out that I knew what I might listen to, or at least have a chance of listening to and what might not. So um, I speak, I try and speak in a way that the former me would listen to. So it's both the former me and then my children is always the audience that I had in mind. And so that gave my content a certain flavor. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I don't think that everyone should do that. I think that's completely wrong because that would be very like... Genevieve that wouldn't be the way you would do it or or um like mm -hmm. everyone has to find their own way and their own there's people that you guys speak to that I'm not able to speak to right um so I think that's why the many voices approach yeah is what I always encourage. have you heard from your kids have they seen it do you know I am so they are now all of them are adults who are on their own journeys I it's not my place to go on the internet to talk about their current journeys other than that my relationship with them is very solid good and we are more open to talking about these things than those original days uh they're all at different spots and i i will let them have their privacy yeah i understand that completely i i have the same questions in my mind i we share we share similarities there too because i've got adult kids who don't have one one child in particular doesn't have connection with me but the other one does the other two do but i'm, I'm I, incredibly fortunate that i salvaged those relationships yeah so you really I'm are sorry i'm sorry to hear that you that you didn't keep them all but well still it's still time because for a while for several years both of my daughters didn't didn't have contact with me and then one of them has in the last couple of years and so i'm grateful for that but i don't have any for instance, my content, I have no way of knowing if they've seen it, if they watch anything. I mm. don't know if they've read my memoir. Uh, I don't know. I don't even I don't even want to ask because I, I don't think I want to hear the answer. But like you said, they have their own journey. And and I love the way you put it. And I've said this because that's the way I raised them. And mm. my my changes are not their fault. It, it's me that did the changing. It's me that went through this massive overhaul of, of a worldview. And they've just stayed consistent with the, the very thing I trained them in. I can't fault them for that. No, it's, it's, I, I feel for you though. It's in, it's one of, it's one of the hardest things. One it is. Things. Yeah. So, you know, your, your YouTube project, this is a very, uh, sort of a personal project did you ever expect that it would be anything other than this sort of time capsule for your kids to be able to look back on to try to understand you and and why everything happened in your life the way it did so i would love to say humble and say no i never <laughs> did <laughs> um but part of me uh, i mentioned before that i'm competitive um and yeah you did mention that Part of me was literally trying to then once I decided I was going to do YouTube, then I'm like, well, t teach me everything about YouTube and what's the best practices on YouTube and how do I like conquer the YouTube machine? Um, and part of me, I'm, 
I'm a little bit audacious in my own expectations of myself. Uh, so for example, I, you know, started a star Wars website and George Lucas hired me a few years later. Right. So, um, it's, I, I tend to set these things up for myself. Now I've, I've failed at a lot of stuff. So that's, I've many, many things I've also failed at, but my expectations are always grand. So I don't know. I, I, I thought, I thought that I could do at, I thought I could do what the Christians were doing. Like that was yeah. my, that was my target, right? It was like, and my initial targets were creation today, Eric Hovind and Ken Ham. And frankly, they're not, they were not doing the internet that great. So that was really, I mean, that's the only bar I had to hurdle. So it, it wasn't like I, you know, and you've gotten, like the, you've gotten their attention. Why do you think that, the, because you have so many followers and your channel has grown so much, is that, is that why they seem to be wanting to engage with you? You've gotten the attention of these people. You've had dialogues with them. Yeah. Them I've, on your I've, show. It's weirdly, I've now had, yeah, I've had all, all these interactions with all these Christian apologists that I never would have expected and I never did when I was a Christian. It's weird. I, there's a couple of things. One, I think slowly over the years, I've accumulated, I've slowly accumulated an audience and it's been a long time. So it's not like it all popped in at once. Right. But um, I think the other part is that I'm not as easily dismissed as the kind of atheist content where they're saying the F word, right? Then it's, they, they don't have to worry. My audience isn't going to watch that. Yeah, it's it's because I was specifically using their vocabulary That's a good and point. and addressing things in a way that they that their constituents were listening to that. I, I got the feedback that basically people are coming to them with my videos because they're comfortable with my videos and saying, well, what about this? This is this is raising doubts for me. Yeah. Um, and so it's I think it's the combination of style and then over the years, um, a more of an accumulated audience that. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I, I, I also I treat their ideas with respect as well because I took I took it seriously. So yeah, that's I, the thing you and I, do, those of us in that world, we don't we don't slam dunk on them and call them stupid because we were that guy, we were that person, we thought that way, we understand how you can think that way, and so yeah, we're kind, kinder, and more right. understanding. So I think it's, <clears throat> I think that's and then of course there's always luck. I mean luck is luck is part well, of it. But, you become best friends with Eric Coven, so I'm looking. Forward I know, right? To seeing, <laughs> seeing where that goes. <laughs> it's the guy I built my channel on, and now we're this weird, odd couple of friends that we we, we talk and message, and yeah, uh, I recently had a yeah. conversation with him on his channel. So, yeah, that's a buddy cop show I would watch. Yeah, buddy cops. <laughs> uh, we got a question um, here from yeah. Zap Brannigan. I want to throw that at you, uh, super chat. Thank you, Zap six sixty six. Another Antichrist donation we're going to hell all of us uh what is the best argument for christianity if you had to pick one um sorry sweet heathen just the heathen queen totally distracting me in the uh in the queen, chat so now queen heathen, what's up heathen queen i i she you know yes sorry so can we read the question again because now i now oh, i uh, put it back no i'm heathen. all flummoxed can you put it back up, Ethan? Uh, what is your best argument for Christianity? Oh. Do you think Jesus really existed? Some really strong historians say no. So, so what is can your I work best backwards? argument? Yeah, sure. Uh, I, I'm going to work backwards on do I think Jesus existed. Um, I think it's more likely than not that the legend of Jesus was based on one or more real people. And I, I won't go into all the reasons for that, but I think it's more plausible that they... It was based on something. Do I, if I got in a time machine though, I don't think I could go to Jerusalem and point out the guy because I don't think that we would recognize a time traveler would recognize this, you know, Hesh Yahshua guy that, that they were there. So I, I think it makes more sense to me. It's based on real place. If it turns out there isn't, that doesn't surprise me. But for mm -hmm. the sake of my venture as well, it does me no good to try to fight about historicity with a Christian. Right. Who are I, I am working on the outside doctrines of was the Jesus in the Bible? Did that describe a real human? Right. So I feel like I cover if, if I get them away from that, the Bible was describing a real person's life. Then it doesn't matter what one much one or the other if there really was someone's life who shared that same name and maybe a yeah, couple. Of I agree events. with that. So, yeah. So um, so I just go. Look, I love my mythicist brethren and sisterin, but uh, it's not that's not my fight, and it's not where I, I feel strongly convicted. Mm -hmm. uh, best argument for 
was it argument for deism or for for christianity, for deism or for for, christianity? For the, yeah uh the best argument would have to be well the holy spirit really honestly like it would have to be some i would have personal experience i think is the best this argument the only for thing that. they can cling to i think isn't it yeah um yeah. the rest of it because the rest of the arguments basically get you to theism right so i can i can be fine with an argument from design that uh, certain things appear to be designed. I don't think that they need to be designed, but I can, I could concede that some things are pretty cool. Uh, so, but that doesn't get you to Christianity, right? That mm -hmm. gets you to uh, a God who a God may have just walked kind. away. Right. A designer who mm -hmm. may or may not care about our lives. So yeah, if it's Christianity specifically, I think it's the personal experience, but of course every religion has personal experiences. So it would actually, but mine is real to me, and that's where they land. Right. Is I know that he changed my life, and you can't talk me out of that. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, and until I have such an experience, like I, you, someone else's personal experience doesn't work for anyone other than them. Exactly. So that's actually why I, I'm fine if Christians want to pray for me. Like I, I don't, I'm never offended by that. If you want to pray that the Holy Spirit will reveal themselves in that way, I'm sure they you are. Knock yourself out. Yeah. I'm sure Eric is. Uh, a question in the chat I want to throw out also, and then it's going to lead us to the uh, a phone call I want to get to. I'm, I see you there. I know you've been waiting. But um, at, did you experience religious trauma when deconverting, and how did you work through it, Paul? Uh, a lot. Uh, I okay. desperately, desperately wanted it to be true. And then so there, were, there was all that. There was the realizing that I probably would lose community and then losing community. My all my business partners were Christians. Mm -hmm. uh, every, every friend I had was a Christian. I had no Christ friends who weren't Christians. Right. Um, I, I went to church four times a week. I mean, that was the, my whole world was that. So losing yeah. that, that was also trauma. But then when I was out far enough, then I was able to look back and look at the way I didn't think you'd have asked me while I was a Christian, are you being harmed? Are you, be is your life being curtailed? Or like, I would have said, no, my life's amazing. It's great. It was, I'm living this great, great life. And then afterwards, then I start, you can look back and you can see the way that my life wasn't the way I thought that it was. Um, and then I started having some serious trauma and regret and still carry to this minute um, a lot of uh, trauma and regret. And I, you know, it's between me and the therapist that I should be going to about what some of those details are. <laughs> but um, no, I carry, I carry a lot. I yeah, a it's of, not uncommon. Yeah, it's not uncommon. Sadly, it's all it's all too common in our uh, in our world. That's a good reason why a lot of us do what we do is to help people process those changes. Um, but I don't fear hell anymore, which is a, an improvement. Yeah, you were indoctrinated as a kid that it was a real place that you could slip up and go to, right? Yep, eternal yeah. conscious torment was. Yep. The, I saw the, your tweet. You, what was your tweet today um, about hell? Was it today? Or oh, yesterday? Uh, yeah. Well, I, what I, I was that? Weird things all the time. So I, I think I said today that uh, if hell is real, that it is not a place it, that it is the punishment of hell is entirely punitive. Right. It is neither corrective nor protective. Exactly. Someone someone was asking me the other day my thoughts about just, you know, prisons and that kind of thing. And in general, I, I feel like punishment in North America, we do it entirely wrong. And the oh, only reason, 100%. the only reason we should, the only things we should do to people is try and protect the rest of society. So protective and then figure out a way to help correct or help them. Right. Like those are the two things. But what we do in North America is we have this punitive, we, 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 we revel in like, we're, we're punishing you for our own satisfaction and enjoyment. Right. And it came to, I came to realize, well, wait, that's exactly what hell is. There's no corrective element because we can't get out of hell. Like, it's not like God is improving our behavior. And we're also yeah. not protect, he's not protecting the people in heaven from us. And the Christians would argue that it's, it's protective, the, that we're setting it because of our example of God's punishment, that it, it scares people into following God. You see what I'm saying? Mm, well, that, that's not. I guess that's not what I mean by prote protective. That's you know, that's that's a. Uh, oh, I know you're not, but they they would argue that. Yeah. So so that would be to more as a, as a deterrent. So I guess if you want to if you want to say that hell is a deterrent, then absolutely right. A deterrent. Right. The chat's blown up about how hot you are, and also um, Genevieve, I'm sure, or uh, Dave. 
Well, started with you, Paul. Um, <laughs> Heathen <laughs> Queen right. also says, "Go to." <laughs> Go go to therapy, bitch. Okay, so that's mm. Heathen Queen's advice. <laughs> um, I know I'm supposed. I should. Let me. Um, this call's been waiting a, a while. I want to get to it. I didn't want to interrupt what we were talking about, but I do want to uh, catch this call. He him from Texas. Uh, hello, you're on with Genevieve, Dave, and Paula Gia. Are Hi, you there? Um, hey, I thanks for thanks went, for waiting. I wanted to. Oh, not a problem. Not a problem at all. Um, I just wanted to throw this out there. Um, we were, I was hearing Paul's story. I've heard it several times, but um, this this will kind of give you a head scratcher. So I was put in a good little cult from the state of Texas, actually. Um, and I'm sorry it was shortly that. after David Koresh, and I was I was, I, the, uh, my dad had died when I was four, and then I had become a Christian when I was eight. Um, and I kind of think that the preacher kind of tweaked it to where it would fall right on the days of where my dad mm. had passed away. Mm. So, I'm sorry. Um, That's cruel. I, I, went, I, went, I went to church, and it was a revival of course, and it was Independent Fundamental Baptist. And uh, I went into church thinking, you know, I I really need to figure out this whole thing because I was already mourning with my dad. I usually mourn every year my dad, you know, has been gone. Um, and the deacon of the church um, got in good with my grandmother. My grandma, uh, how do I describe her? Um, Pentecostal because she loved John Hagee for some reason and then right after that she would turn it on Jerry Springer so uh, very about the same uh, yeah yeah very very odd um, I loved her to death though but my my mom has she turns 80 this year and it's just crazy um, because she could have died when she had my brother and she had me when she was 42 and the doctors were all mad mm -hmm. anyway. Um, but um, my, so I remember watching David Gresh go down. And so that's why I'm kind of fuzzy because I was, I was quite young. And uh, so I went to the church and I had, we'd been going there for a year or whatever. And during the, the last day of the revival, I'm sitting on the back row, and the preacher's been hammering at me all week, I feel. So I grab my brother's hand, my older brother, and I, and I drag him to the front with me, and I do the whole sinner's prayer and stuff like that. And so at that point, I thought I wanted to be a preacher. So okay. uh, when I when I got my mom and my family's health started going down, and so my the the deacon of the church riddled into my my into my family basically, and I'm going to throw this out there just because I need to tell this part of the story. Um, my aunt was married to my father back when she was 14 years old and my dad was 21 and it was it was crazy time and so the deacon knew my aunt and so the deacon and my aunt and the pastor was working together all the all together and so they knew I got a, a, a government check from the state so my nanny signed that over into the cult before oh. I even knew it. Mm -hmm. That for the care of me. But so the, the plan was my nanny, her health, she had been put in the hospital several times. So my aunt started the gear to say, okay, well, let's cut him out of the family because she was very 
and she, to this day she says my dad raped my mom, which is which is not true. Um, so when I so they they coerced into this this big three people in the family. Well, then they brought CPS in, and we grew up. I mean, I would, I mean, I wore my shoes for four or five years, duct tape them. I mean, we were poor. Yeah. So, and this is in, in the mid 90s. So, of course, CPS was all over. And they wanted up sending me to, it's called New Bethany Girls and Boys Home. It was located in Arcadia, Louisiana. And you can actually Google Earth it, and you can look it up online. There's there's tons of pictures and photos, and there's a lot of people that um, have went through that the, that home. Um, yeah. It look, you you look it up, and you can tell it's a cult. Well, I I started questioning things, and I had woke up one night. And we would sing a cadence when we, we marched. Like, we were literally marching the war, basically, you know, the, the whole, all the different songs. That Onward the Christian Bible. Soldiers, yep. Like yep, Christian Soldiers, I was going to yeah. say. Yeah. Marching off to war. Yeah. We didn't and, sing that in the Mennonite Church, though, because of yeah. pacifists, but. That's right. <laughs> but that's, Carry on. that's what we did. Yeah. And so. During the day, we they would have. I, I was I served a little time in the Navy, so I kind of put it in with this. Um, we had what was called watch duty, which was in the military, and we had it in the boys' home too. And during the day, there was only two, you know, one on the girls' side, one on the boys' side, and that the whole we couldn't even look at the girls, or we were going to get beat. Because the pastor had knocked up several, excuse my language, but, and he was trying to protect his flock, supposedly. Mm. And so during the day, you know, they'd open the gate and we'd ask for permission to come across and stuff like that. Well, I had woke up one night and I didn't understand what this whole watch was. And he got 16 foot you know, gate plus razor wire on top of it. Well, there's a, there was a crosswalk. And I woke up one night and I just looked out the windows and they had like eight people on watch at night and they were 16 years or older. And I catch this look of they're carrying assault rifles. During the day, this wasn't, this wasn't busy. And so I was like, why are they trying to protect and all this other stuff? And I started questioning it then. Well, it was about, uh, I don't know how long I was there until I got out. Um, I do know when that happened, but, um, when did, when did you get out of the cult? Uh, um, You obviously got, you've left religion behind and, Realized the evils of it and the damage it had done to you. How long have you been out of it and how did you get out? Um, well, I was, I had just turned, uh, let's see, because I was fifth, I was in there during my third and fourth grade. So when I came out, um, my only reason I know this part is my uncle Johnny on my dad's side had passed away and he died in 96. So I knew I was in there from a certain date until the certain date that I got out. Mm -hmm. But I don't know how long the transition was. But later on, I actually, uh, it was during COVID when I actually finally said, you know, I think I'm atheist. And from listening to Apologia, Beth Andrews, Aaron Raw, uh, Telltale. Um, yeah. I, I, I finally, because I even, I even worked for Chick-fil-A. I was going to actually try to become, uh, uh, go to corporate 
And Chris, Christian I chicken. Sell that Christian chicken. Not the bigot bird. Yes. Yeah. See, Paula yeah. Gia, see the work you're and, doing? You're reaching I, people. I see. That's I'm, awesome. I'm looking forward to the head. We're Are we getting a head scratcher yet? People, man. But, you know, I, it was kind of like, I didn't want to go corporate because I knew I had a foul mouth and I didn't want to look like a hypocrite. So, and I've always had a temper too. Well, tell tell so, us we and, need to we do uh, we need to wrap up pretty quick because we're about out of time for the show. Uh, but um, really glad we're really glad you got out of the cult. Tell us how you're doing now with because your call said uh, dealing I with am, mental issues and treatment. How are you doing now with the trauma that was that was uh, that you were subjected to? It it it's still hard to because of a lot of my friends um they're like i can't believe you just told me you're atheist and, you know i i wore my religion on my on my letterman jacket because i used to have crosses mm -hmm. and red white and blue ribbons and i did all that and uh i mean i me i've lost a lot of my friends even right my i mean i have two or three good friends but as far as me mentally mm -hmm. I have never felt in, I've never felt clear thought as I do now good so I mean I went through the whole anger thing and all that but now I just kind of let people talk and I watch them and um, you know I, I it whatever makes them feel happy as long as they don't try to force that on my kids because right I, I, my even my youngest son. He asked me a few a few weeks ago. He's like, Dad, do you believe in God? And I said, I said, Why are you asking? And he's like, Oh, I'm just asking. And I said, No. And he's like, Oh, I thought you believed in God. And I said, I've never told you anything, have I? He's like, No. I said, well, why would you think I believed in God? He's like, well, you're a good dad, and most Christians are, of course, Christians who talk then. Mm. And I said, He'll meet some more later. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, um, it doesn't make you. Paul, do you have any thoughts with, before we let the caller go? Did you have any thoughts to share with him he, since he. No, I'm just, I'm so. Gr pleased and grateful that i was able to have some small part right. in a list of amazing people you had there but also just so grateful that you are in a better place now and that you are finding your way out and and we encourage you to look at all the resources that are always in dave's uh description links to to find ways to find connections and help if you ever need it yeah i was going to mention that too um yeah. you're pretty fresh out of this if you do do feel like you want someone to talk to uh, to process your changes recovering from religion. Um, they'll probably put the uh, the link in the chat, but recoveringfromreligion.org. They've got great people to talk with, talk through some of these things because you've been through a lot of shit and a lot of changes and um, that takes a toll on us. So I hope you're taking care of yourself. Yeah, it does. Oh, oh man. I, yeah, I've totally changed a lot of things about me. Good. And I, I actually, I actually tell some of my friends, I'm like, I think I'm a better Christian than most Christians are. Yeah. <laughs> so, You're not wrong. Yeah. Oh, well, thanks for calling tonight. It was good to chat with you. Sorry for waiting so long on hold. We just couldn't All get right. to you, but thanks for calling in. Keep watching Apologia. All right. Thank you guys. All right. Oh, I bye -bye. will. <laughs> All right. Y'all have a good night. You too. Wow. You know what? Sadly, those kind of stories are not that uncommon. Mm. We, we've we seen it over and over and over again. And uh, but it's always fresh for that person, right? Like it's, it, we, yeah, I, I need to, I need to always guard myself that I don't get jaded when I hear just because oh, exactly. I heard that story over the repetition shouldn't make us bored. It should make us be angry that this is a pattern. That's exactly what I was going to say. It makes me so yeah. angry that it's so common and that these stories that the, the abuse that we hear of over and over again at the, in, in the name of religion. And we, we know these people who are perpetrating this are not good people. It's clear. We know that it's clear that Jesus has not changed their lives and made them better. 
uh, they're just they're using it as a as a it's it's the tool they use to get people mm. and to do the things they want to do. Wonder she her super chat to close the night. Mostly just want to say thanks for another good show. Oh, I a question for you. Here we go. I'm a little curious okay. if Paula, Gia, and Shannon Q met at an atheist related event. If you would like to answer. So if how I, did they? That's I, the I know question. I I know I said that the other caller couldn't plug their own stuff, but I'm going to plug mine because you asked. So of I of course have a you're going to plug. I have you're my guest. He's an annoying yeah, caller. No, no, no. But this is specifically. <laughs> so I have a channel called Apology Alive, and uh, a few weeks ago was the anniversary of when Shannon and I met, oh. and we met on a call-in show. We met on a on a show, and I actually posted the. So if you go to Apology Alive and type in when Shannon Q and Apology met, I actually recently posted the very con our very first conversation was recorded and is now preserved it. for history. So you can go find it there. But it was indeed I was going to the Creation Museum and was soliciting help. I needed help about how to question Ken Ham and what I should do. And of course, Shannon is such an expert on on how on dialectical tactics and you know all this kind of stuff that she called in to give me advice on how to deal with Ken Ham, and we started talking from there. So it was, uh, it was pretty great. She called him because she thought you were cute. Let's just be honest here. Mm, uh, mm. I was just the cartoon back then. So oh, that's true. Like so my cartoon then. That, how long ago yeah. was that? Uh, that was in 2017, I want to say. If I'm okay. wrong about that, then don't cancel me. <laughs> I'm not, you know, the the guy sometimes gets those wrong. But yeah, I think oh yeah, no, I I'm, I'm totally in that boat too. I understand. <laughs> so you guys are like the atheist power couple now. It's yeah. uh, not December. I was just recently with Dan Barker and Annie Laura Gaylor, the co-chairs of uh, Freedom from Religion Foundation, mm. and they met years ago on the Oprah Winfrey show. He was a oh wow, he was a, a new <laughs> ex Christian atheist, and she was uh, her and her mom were FFRF founders, mm. and uh, yeah, it was pretty pretty fascinating story. But we're we're grateful for the work that both you and Shannon do. You guys are awesome. Appreciate. And it's been so great and, having you on. And I appreciate both of you so much, Genevieve. We didn't get into it, but I was I was an early fan of yours, as you know. I was plugging your channel, so yeah. And and I don't know if you if you knew that you were actually the whole reason why I'm here. Um, I yeah, you made that one video and about about atheists on TikTok, and you said the one thing you could do to help them is just make your own stuff. It's really easy. And I'd mm. been binge watching your channel for about a year a little over a year at that point and i was like okay i've got time on my hands let's do this and um, shortly after that i saw genevieve's tiktok and i said let's do a show so yeah that, that was so you're, yeah. you're welcome everyone i helped they, you yeah. right. go happen yes. so. all things happen <laughs> it's kind of like god yeah. he just makes it happen I can My spot <laughs> talent. That's what I call. I can. Dave's this. Dave feels the same. Dave and I can spot yeah. talent, and the and we did most of the talking. That was stupid. No, yeah, no, well, I don't do that. Yeah, my, sorry. My my running joke is always, uh, if God, uh, you know, if God exists, He really wants me to talk about how He doesn't. Because uh, mm. everything is. Yeah, that's a good line. So well, yeah. Good one. Well, everybody, go follow Apology if you're not already. I'm sure you are. Uh, amazing content. Um. I'll let you know, Paul, if uh, when I hear back from Eric Hoven, we're supposed to, Paul, you, Paul Sounds connected good. us uh, via email and he wants me to, I think, have a conversation with him. So I'm mm -hmm. all up for that if, uh, if it happens. I mean, it's, fun. it's his audience. That's the bonus part, right? So it's, yeah, not, I'm, I got nothing to lose. If you, yeah. If you get to it. talk to Christians, all bring it. Board, yeah. I would love that. Yeah. Well, that's awesome, and we thank you for everyone who called, for everyone in the Super Chat. Thank you for uh, the chatters all together, and thank you for watching. Also, like and subscribe if you haven't, and if you want to, we'd appreciate your Patreon support. And uh, Paul, thanks again, man. It's been great. Love it. It's our show Talk for tonight. Soon.